Phase World Podcast helps independent creators live their creative and financial freedom. I'm your host, Fei Wu, and I'll be taking you through a series of interviews with creators from around the world who are living life on their own terms. Each episode is packed with tactics, nuggets you can implement, origin stories to make listening productive and enjoyable. We're not only focused on the more aspirational stories, but relatable ones as well. We also have non-interview-based mini-series releasing throughout the year to help deep dive into topics such as freelancing, marketing, even indie filmmaking that will benefit creators like you. Show notes, links, and ways to connect with the guests are available on phaseworld.com. Now, on to the show. Hello there, this is Faye again from Phase World. Thank you for joining us this week on the Phase World podcast. I have a guest named Darius Furro. In English, it translates to rich and kindly, and that's the first name of our guest today. And this name is originated from Iran. But Darius was born and raised in Holland, and his parents are immigrants from Iran. Dutch is his first language along with Iranian, not English, but you never know through his writing. As I learned during our conversation earlier, English is an official language used by schools and nearly all the universities in Holland. And Darius also worked in England for a few years. Don't we all love these amazing origin stories? So why interview Darius? Like, who is this guy? Darius, a name not as familiar to you, perhaps compared to someone like Seth Godin, Malcolm Gladwell, or Tim Ferriss. He is the most read author on Medium. But how? Darius shows no jazz hands during our recording. It's truly a step-by-step, drip-by-drip process of how he built his company, which includes writing, books, workshops, and he showcases many drawings of his own on his website, which makes it intimate and memorable. I couldn't help but purchasing an iPad Pro for myself recently to get started, doing that for Phase World Media, whether it's podcast or who knows, our new YouTube channel, because I've always loved drawing. In fact, I pop into his website and constantly recommend his content and style of writing to my friends and clients I work with. It's incredibly personal, no nonsense, and to the point. He's also the author of six books, including the most recent release, Think Straight, and also What It Takes to Be Free. There's one question that is at the core of his work. How can we live a useful life that matters? In addition, Darius also writes about productivity. How can we achieve more without sacrificing our well-being, habits, what habits will make our lives better, and how can we form them? Decision-making, what ways of thinking lead to better decisions? Last but not least, personal finance, how do we build wealth without sacrificing our integrity? In this episode, we talk about the power we have all within us, which we often overlook. So learn to write, to persuade, have a point of view is really critical in the 21st century. And I want to take a moment and thank you for listening. It's been five years since we started this podcast. I won't be here without you. So I'm also thrilled to announce that we have started a YouTube channel. You can find us simply by searching for Phase World, F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D, where I share more tips and tools for independent creators to help them thrive financially and creatively. Without further ado, please welcome Darius Furrow to the Phase World podcast. I've been reading your blog for a long time. I've subscribed to your email list for a long time and getting like weekly, at least two articles. And it reminded me today that your writing is like similar to Seth in a way. Do you read a lot from Seth Godin? Like who are some of the people you follow and that you like and enjoy and respect? Yeah, so um, I do read Seth's work. And um, I remember because I studied marketing. Um, that's my background. I, uh, I, so here in the Netherlands, um, you have university colleges and you have like real universities. So I did both and I did <laughs> both of them. I, uh, specialized in marketing. So, um, I graduated in 2011 and by the time, uh, Seth was already uh, like 
well known all Huge. over the world, you know. I, it, even more so the last few years. But um, Purple Cow was the was the number one book that everybody in marketing uh, knew. So um, yes. just reading his work, I got a couple of things out of it. Like um, you have to stand out, and uh, also I I always enjoyed his very um, clear mm-hmm. way of explaining things and not using more words than is absolutely necessary. Yeah. So that has been an inspiration to me. Um, But I never applied it because I always, like a lot of creative people, Mm -hmm. feel that they have to be very original. And if someone is already doing something, they feel like, oh, I can't do it because then I'm not original anymore. Mm -hmm. So when uh, I read uh, Steal Like an Artist a few years ago, I love By that Austin book. Cleon. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, uh, I was right like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, I was like, uh, yeah, screw all that. I'm just going to steal stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, like other people also steal stuff, and you can call it inspiration. You can call it stealing. But uh, just if you're honest about it, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, it it's very beneficial. So. Um, That's how I got really serious about uh, creating my own voice. But, you know, once I started stealing some stuff, some bits and pieces, right? Seth's work. uh, I enjoyed Ryan Holiday's work. um, And and especially reading Ryan Holiday's work was beneficial to me because he was, he's the same age as I am. Mm -hmm. So reading his work, I was like, okay, this guy's my age and look at him. Uh, you know, publishing books, being successful, why can't I do the same, right? Wow. That's how I got started. Yeah, he's young. Now I realize how young you are. Wow, mm-hmm. this is this is incredible. So, you know, it's interesting, like sometimes after I find myself interviewing people whose work I'm very familiar with, and I find myself to be like, you know, my head just draws these blanks of feeling that I know you really well through your writing. And I think that's the feeling that I'm getting from you. And I know you write about that quite a bit too, of someone, your readers feel like they're already your best friends. And (laughs) how do you, how did you develop your own voice? Um, So one of my goals uh, when I started writing was um, just to write the way that I talk. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of my core values is authenticity. Mm -hmm. Uh, For me, that's, I think, you know, one of the most important things, um, not only in my work, but also in life in general, I, I prefer to be myself, <laughs> if that makes sense. Me too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, because uh, a few years ago, so before I started my writing career, I was a little bit um, thinking about, you know, what direction should I take with my, uh, with my should, what direction should I go in with my career? And um, I also have a family business that we started in 2010, Mm -hmm. uh, which has nothing to do with, you know, things that I'm passionate about. It's a wholesaler of industrial laundry machines, right? (laughs) So (laughs) it's great because people have to uh, wash their uh, linen Mm -hmm. and clothes and whatnot. But uh, I wasn't passionate about it. But I learned a lot of business skills, persuasion skills, all those things. Uh, But when I started, thinking about, you know, what should I do? Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I want to try working for a corporation. So that's what I did. I moved to London, worked for an IT research firm. And then at that stage, I was like, okay, a lot of people are not being themselves. And I noticed it with myself as well. I was like, wow, I'm starting to change a little bit. And I didn't like that. So at that time, I really made the decision, uh, like, I'm going to be myself. Mm -hmm. And in whatever I do. So I decided to pursue a writing career. And I was like, I'm going to do this the way that I want to. And if people, if it doesn't resonate with people, I was okay with that because I made the decision and it kind of gave me peace, you know? So um, that's how I really um, found my voice or is just to accept Mm -hmm. um, who I am. I know that you started writing. Uh, consistently and really taking it serious in 2015. 
Um, were you writing a lot before then as well, or literally the year 2015 is when you developed your voice, your formula, and your content? Yeah, actually, it was uh, at, at that time that I started uh, writing consistently. Um, and before that, I, I had thought about writing uh, years earlier because I remember when I graduated, mm -hmm. um, I thought about giving writing a try. And I was always passionate about it. But at the time, I had nothing to write about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know, I don't, I don't have anything to share. So at that time, I can't remember exactly whether I made this, uh, whether I made a conscious decision or not. But I remember just quitting mm -hmm. writing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to just explore the world and I'm going to travel. I'm going to give um, our family business my best mm -hmm. and I'm going to say yes to a lot of opportunities. And that brought me to a lot of places. I spent like almost a month in Shanghai working with a partner of our family business, uh, working on a uh, software system for uh, industrial laundry machines. Uh, that, that was very interesting. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, yeah, I spent some time in the U.S. Um, out in uh, uh, outside of New Haven, mm -hmm. um, also working with a partner, uh, and and you know traveled a lot in, in Europe as well, where, because it's a very international business. It's a small industry, uh, and it's very connected all over the world. So uh, they brought me a lot of uh, new lessons um, in terms of just. You know, working with people from different mm -hmm. um, cultures and different mentalities. And I think, you know, that, that was very beneficial to me as a person. And it, it helped me to, you know, develop a lot of emotional intelligence. Mm. I, I think traveling really helps. And I always encourage people, especially when they're younger, ideally before 25, to go move to a country for a while, six months to a year and speak a completely different language. So meaning if you're English, then, you know, yeah, come to the U.S. is very convenient, but it would be really awesome to have to explore and learn something from the ground up. Uh, how many languages do you speak, if I may ask? You clearly speak Dutch, English. Yeah, and Farsi as well. Uh, my parents mm -hmm. are Iranian, so speak the language. Uh, I had a, I took Spanish class in, uh, when I was <laughs> in college, but Mm -hmm. uh, my Spanish is not good, but it is one of those. It, it is one of those things that I want to do a little bit more of. Is um, I'd like to learn more languages, mm -hmm. and I really agree with what you said. And also, I think from a just a mental point of view, just acquiring new sk skills. I'm I'm a real uh, uh, believer of uh, acquiring new sk skills, mm -hmm. and I think it's just good for your own development. And even if you don't use it all the time, uh, just the, the process of acquiring a new skill is just so, um, mm -hmm. like almost like a strength training for your brain. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, you know, for many, many years, we've been running our podcast for five years now. And, uh, I, I that's why I find your stories to be fascinating because you started writing actually later than I started podcasting, but your consistency, the mm -hmm. quality of your content, it's really up there, which we're going to cover in a second, but we started interviewing people from all walks of life. I call them unsung heroes and self-made artists and creators. I found myself ended up interviewing a lot of doctors and mm. there are very few doctors in my family, to be honest, but, you know, I learned things about Usher syndrome and, you know, to break down certain diseases and, you know, how doctors able to, and how they choose to communicate with patients, you know, once they're they're diagnosed with a very serious uh, illness. And I was able mm -hmm. to share those episodes with my friends and family, you know, who discover when their friends are hospitalized and what they can do and how they can initiate the conversation. And truth mm -hmm. be told for when I don't talk to with someone like you, you know, you clearly have a very expansive uh, mindset to say, it's okay for me to, to acquire a skill, even if I don't need it every moment of my life mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Um, it's refreshing, but others may have talked to me. It's like, why do we even find that interesting? Like, yeah. why do you want to talk to doctors? Like, are you crazy? You know, it's, <laughs> I, I love yeah. finding my own tribe. 
Yeah, it's really funny. Uh, I, I, to be honest, and I, I get that type of thinking as well because mm. at times I feel uh, feel that way as well. Like, um, I, for example, the whole like podcast and th- thing as well. So I have my own podcast, and I was very interested and and passionate about it. Mm-hmm. And I learned some skills that I'm probably never going to use. <laughs> outside of <laughs> running my own podcast in terms uh-huh. of just audio editing and uh, all that stuff. Um, but I don't know. There is something about, I really like, um, you know, how you, maybe you can relate to this as well. When you started your own podcast, it's like you get so absorbed in figuring everything out. Yeah. Right. And that's a yeah. good feeling. Oh, it feels great. And, you know, recently we just, same thing happened to me for the second time, which is for uh, my partner and producer to start exploring YouTube. And mm. and we were trying to be, and I know you have a YouTube channel. I actually watched a lot of your videos, including like the setup uh, of your mm. studio and how you have this <laughs> whiteboard, right? And, and yeah, yeah. I find it really fascinating. I wanted to watch a video from you because I love your content and I find your content to be so much more relatable than someone to say, you should really have a $50,000 camera and this is the mm. perfect lighting system for another $20,000. Like <laughs> you're, you're all about, hey, let's get raw. Let's create and this is how you do it. And mm. I, you know, I wake up, I think people like us go to sleep happy, wake up vibrant and, yeah. you know, ready to tackle and to learn new things. Yeah. I can feel it like in my blood. Mm. It's like I'm dancing to a piece of music I love. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I feel the same. And um, it's just this thing. I was talking to, I can't remember, I was talking to somebody this week who <laughs> um, who was really surprised. Some, someone, I think, uh, at the gym who uh, I got talking with him and he uh, was like, hey, let me look at your website and immediately mm. looked it up. And it was like, yeah, who does this? Who does the drawings? Uh, who did the design? And who did this? It was like, yeah, I did that. Yeah. And it was like, who did it? Was like, I did that. It was like, and then after a while, I was like, dude, I do everything myself. <laughs> 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 and, and for some people, mm-hmm. it's weird, but I don't know. To me, it's the, the first thing that I think of is how can I learn to do this? Mm-hmm. And to be honest, like I accept that at some things, um, I'm not as good as somebody who's doing that for their whole life. Mm-hmm. But the, the good thing is uh, for everybody who's now, you know, who wants to do some creative work, there are so many tools and there's so much information out there that you can relatively easy learn most of the things. If you really want to build a big corporation, mm-hmm. of course, you need a staff. <laughs> but if you want to do something creatively, you don't need get you, you. You can do everything yourself, and there are no gatekeepers anymore. Uh, so you know, I think that's that's very exciting. It's very liberating, and I love uh, your artworks. And my, you know, nearly my entire family are artists and musicians. And when I see mm. your, yeah, when I see your artwork, I'm it's just so refreshing. Some are funny, some are, you know, very kind of bold strokes, uh, very clear, and you know, and that's so, I know you use some stock images as well. Every once in a while, maybe on medium, mm-hmm. but, uh, or, yeah. or something, but like nearly all your blog posts come with these original drawings. And mm-hmm. may I ask like, what kind of tools that you currently use today to kind of create those things and those drawings? Yeah, so, um, I use an iPad pro with a, a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that that's the, like I was, pretty lucky as well with um uh with the whole blogging stuff i think my blog really took off in 2016 and you know the ipad pro came out as well i think around that time yeah so yeah. it was a great tool for me because i could really um you know establish a a true identity for myself creatively and if I didn't have that tool, it would be very difficult because before that, if you look at my very early posts, it was also stock images. Mm-hmm. But I, I never liked that. I really hated using that mm-hmm. uh, because I just, I don't know. I was like, to me, a lot of blog posts, because we're visual, right? Mm-hmm. right? Most people uh, think visually and 
if if I see a post and I see an image, I connect the post with the image. Mm-hmm. And if I, if I see the image popping up somewhere else, I'm like, whoa, what's going on, right? I just, I just can't place it in my brain. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was thinking like, okay, what if other people have that as well, my readers? Um, it will make it difficult for me to stand out on, if people share your stuff on social media. Mm-hmm. I just want people to look at my stuff and instantly recognize, hey, it's That's Darius, it. you know? Yeah. Wow. Oh, I regret for not drawing myself because I actually grew up drawing and I mm. have my iPad Pro. <laughs> and I think that's why your work, you know, resonated with me. And people are asking me, yeah. Faye, why don't you draw the, you know, featured image images for your blog post or just be creative mm. with the podcast guest posts and things like that? Um, that's brilliant. And before I forget, I have to ask, your English is right to the point. If you didn't call out the fact that you know, you're yeah. from Holland and, you know, uh, you went to school here and there. Like, uh, why and how did you choose English as your primary writing language as opposed to Dutch or mm. some other language? So, yeah, this is uh, a lot of people are often surprised by this. But I think uh, here in the Netherlands, they made a very good uh, strategic choice. I think mm. uh, around 10 or 20 years ago, I can't remember exactly. I, I read it somewhere. But um, so... N- all business schools and all business um, degrees mm-hmm. in the Netherlands are English. Mm, gotcha. Right? So um, I've been studying English or studying uh, material in English mm-hmm. since I was 17. So that's mm-hmm. when I got to university college. And when I got my uh, um, graduate degree, not only was the material in English, we had to speak English as well in class mm-hmm. and doing the presentations. Uh, so at that time, um, I really improved my English a lot mm-hmm. because reading academic English is a lot different from reading a Fight Club novel, right? Or <laughs> uh, right. Catcher in the Rye or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so at that time, I also was all in with that decision of, hey, the Netherlands is a small country. It, it depends on international relationships and uh, the service industry is very big here. So I was like, okay, I'm, go- I'm, I'm going all in with this. And the next step that I made was in 2000, so 2013 or 14, when I moved to London, obviously I had to speak English every day. Mm-hmm. I started thinking in English as well after a while. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was really um, the turning point of I'm just going to go all in with English because my goal uh, with with writing is to reach uh, as much people as I can, as, as many people as I can. So um, to me, that was it wasn't a very difficult decision. And I'm glad that um, I was always interested in English as well. So I remember reading English books when I was 16, mm. you know, so that, that came quite natural to me, fortunately. Yeah, I interviewed uh, I Ming Wei, who was um, going to high school with me, and she's uh, from, Am- not Amsterdam, but she's from Holland. And mm. I remember her as a 15-year-old with very fluent English. And at the time, I was 17, I couldn't even detect any accent. Uh, you know, we both <laughs> a- attended American high schools. So I noticed that. And then I traveled to Amsterdam in 2010. And I realized out of all the European countries outside of the UK that I traveled to, definitely Dutch people have the best English and are the most comfortable speaking the language. Like they, you know, they just, they're, you can barely even notice there's a switch. They look at you, they know that you're from elsewhere and English just comes right out. And yeah. I know that this was originally a first question I wanted to ask you, but I, I'm kind of curious for you to, you know, I don't know when, you know, uh, when your parents immigrated to Holland mm-hmm. and what was it like for you to grow up and, you know, were your parents considered as immigrants mm-hmm. and uh, what mm-hmm. was that dynamic like? So, yeah, well, I was one. So, um, I, you know, basically I adopted all the, the Dutch values and and just way of thinking and and uh, because the Netherlands is a very um, very individual 
uh, focus on the individual. Mm-hmm. The culture is not a, um, it's not a, people don't have a group mentality like you see in the East. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's very um, focused on, on the individual. And, and um, my parents were also really um, on board with that. So I was raised very liberally. And I think that really uh, helped my, um, or really influenced my writing, right? Like my last book, or my latest book is called What It Takes to Be Free. Which is, yeah, I love that title. <laughs> mm-hmm. Basically all about, um, you know, the, the philosophy that I've adopted and but that's influenced by, you know, Dutch culture, but also, uh, you know, American philosophy. I really like uh, Emerson and Thoreau. Um, but just growing up, um, I was also surrounded by... Uh, a lot of Dutch people. So what you all also see here and in European countries and also in America is that uh, actually everywhere where immigrants are, a lot of people decide to surround themselves mm-hmm. with their own uh, people from the same country, right? Mm-hmm. And I think you can notice the difference because what we did is, okay, we say we'll we go in uh, more, we merge ourselves into the Dutch culture and, you know, you, you adopt a, a more open-minded. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, th- that's uh, one of the key decisions, I think, um, uh, that we made. Uh, obviously, I wasn't involved with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I am glad that we did. Hi there, this is Fei Wu and you are listening to the Face World podcast. Today on Face World, I'm joined by Darius Furu, who is an author of six books, including Think Straight and What It Takes to Be Free. There's one question at the core of his work. How can we live a useful life that matters? I, I think that was the mentality I had as well. I, you know, I came to the U.S. from China when I was 17 and kind of thrown into the American high school culture. It was really exciting and a little, little bit nerve wracking at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. But choose to not only be friends with them, but even pick up a lot of these American sports, softball mm-hmm. and ice hockey really helped me kind of immerse into the culture very differently than, than some of the other Chinese students. So. I, I love that. And then I ended up staying, which made it even more important for me to keep yeah. growing uh, my community uh, outside of my comfort zone. So, yeah. Yeah. I think just, just being open minded and um, because you can learn great things from all different cultures. And I think that's one of the things that um, sometimes, um, or some of the, this is one of those things that a lot of people don't really think about. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people just go through their lives like, oh, this is the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't know, somehow, even when I was younger, I always thought about, like, why why is that, you know? Mm -hmm. Just asking why. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think you see that with children, but then when they they get a certain age, they stop asking why. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things that, uh, mm-hmm. I also picked up from uh, Seth Golden is uh, yeah, how, we, how he talks about how the, the, the current education system is basically yeah, it's very built for the industrial revolution, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? That's, a, that's his so, thing right now. Like he's yeah. very focused on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. yeah. I and agree. Yeah, I yeah, I, you know, I had the opportunity to sit down with him and put him on the documentary we're shooting, uh, finished shooting last year. So it was, a, it was a pretty phenomenal experience and to actually do the interview with him and to realize uh, how different he is in person in a good way, you know, and, and yeah. how super professional he is, like 45 minutes on the dot, sign the paper out. <laughs> it's like, it's incredible. Nice. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he's 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 fun. I can't wait for. I mean, if that will ever happen, he turned out to be a really amazing cook, like a, like almost like a professional chef level person. So people are blown away. Mm. Unfortunately, he doesn't talk about or write about it too much. But recently on his blog post, he finally shifted and he started writing about recipes. So mm. yeah, check it out. Oh, okay. um, 
So learning. The, um, how did you guys uh, connect on the documentary? Because I I, re- I saw, saw some of the stuff online as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's super. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty incredible. I mean, he does accept uh, some of these offers from mm-hmm. students, and for me, I was part of that ELT MBA eight group eight. I think is on to like thirty something now. So I'm like one of the OGs attended mm-hmm. the session. I was ready like one, but I was also starting my <laughs> business at the time. Like, I never yeah. like. You know, when he sells you like 3000 at the time it was $3,000 for L10 BA. I, I cannot tell you how quickly I pull up my credit card and just like mm. pay for it. You know, I didn't even think twice um, from that group. And I moved on to the marketing seminar, but I didn't go crazy and sign up for like all the other things, you know, like I, I need mm. some other influences, including, honestly, including you. Other than Seth Godin, you're my like number two blog content I read the oh, most. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. It honestly, it surprised me too, Darius. <laughs> like, I didn't <laughs> quite expect. I'm like, huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I reached out to him uh, about the podcast. To be honest, the first many, many years ago, uh, he mm-hmm. said, not right now. And and then I said, you know what? I'm going to come up with a, a more unique offer for him. So uh, last year, we out of the blue, we said, okay, we have a video production service for Face World. So we're a business as well. And why don't I work with the people I already love working with? But this time, instead of for a client, why don't we do it for FaceWorld? And they all mm. said yes. We traveled from you know Boston and New York to uh, Vegas, LA, back to New York. So, and uh, Seth, I I remember emailing Seth to say this is what I want to do. It's like very detailed email, like bullet points. He replied, mm. sure. What time? <laughs> 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 oh my god. Uh, yeah, and, and that yeah. was pretty funny. So we went, we drove to a Hastings on Hudson. That's where he, he doesn't even live in uh, Manhattan. So we had several people we had to interview and film in Manhattan. And we ended up driving this massive van with all the you know professional camera equipments to Hastings on Hudson, rent an Airbnb there, set up a hotel room and put him in there. So I was like, mm-hmm. Seth, please come meet me at Marriott room 114. I know it sounds really Creepy, but I need you to come. <laughs> and he showed up. I was like, oh, thank God. So, yeah, that was yeah, well, that was cool. Uh, you know, I, I can uh, I, funny a few things, right? So, like uh, the fact that he initially said no, and then you came, you were thinking about, oh, how how can I get him? Uh, you know, get to connect with him on something else, and I think that's. Uh, you know, when you reached out to me as well, I, I, I can really uh, sense that you you real. And, you know, when I checked out the, the website and the stuff that you're doing, I was like, oh, that, that's really cool. Because yes. um, I, I got, get a, quite a lot of uh, requests of people mm-hmm. say, hey, do you want to come on the podcast or do you want to do this or do you want to do that? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I often I don't, you don't ha- even have to look at the website. You can just tell by the email. Email, yeah, yeah. It's like, who <laughs> yeah. is this? Yeah, yeah. It's just the, the way that uh, people communicate. Somehow you get a sense of what people like. I can tell if somebody's not really interested in me. Yeah. Well, that doesn't really come across as you know somebody's really interested in in sharing the world or, or, word, or the your message. Mm-hmm. And also, I really like just connecting with people who are also uh, have a mission. Yeah. So um, that's why, you know, I, you know that, that's, those one of the things that I also kind of picked up from studying guys like Seth Godin um, mm-hmm. is that a lot of authors, they just go on book tour. Yeah. Uh, and now like, or actually podcasting tour and they just go everywhere. Yeah. And I don't know. I, like, I don't, I'm not really a fan of that. I just, I know it's a lot of the know. same content, right? And it's like yeah. recycled content and the bullet points they go through. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting that you notice that as well, because mm. I tell some of the younger podcasters, you know, everybody, we, we really waited until we interviewed Seth and we used it very mm. strategically. And we, we're not trying to prop him up as he is like the, you know, he is the goal, he's the end goal or, yeah. The, the most celebrated guest we've ever had. Like we don't talk about him that way. We're any, anyone else that who are quote unquote famous in tier one. I, I tell people like just by interviewing someone like Seth, like Tim Ferriss, really doesn't do much for your show. Like we should all yeah. 
be aware of the, yeah, you might see a little spike, but mm. you know, they are everywhere. There's an information overload on these people. But yeah. you know, when I, when I yeah. interview a mom who's willing to talk about postpartum depression and how she raised her kids, some of those episodes go viral, like, because mm. they're willing <laughs> to share and they pour their heart out. And then yeah. they're, they're, they're stories you've never heard. And that resonates yeah, yeah, yeah. with people. So that's a very, very good point. And I hope that people who are listening to this really uh, can resonate or just it, it has to click at some point for, uh, <laughs> you know, because often you just think, oh, if I do this, yeah, then this. I'll blow up, right? Or mm-hmm. I'll get a lot of attention. Or if I can connect with this person, uh, maybe, you know, something will happen. And mm-hmm. like you say, the chances are that nothing will happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, at least, ready. like, like the, the 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 big chances that nothing will happen. Uh, and and my my um, I think my advantage of when I started my blog was I was already um, kind of going through the whole starting a business phase and connecting with people and doing a lot of sales and persuasion. And I, by the time, like, even though I have a message with my blog and, and, and I try to, you know, I, I want to give as much as I can. Mm-hmm. It's also a business, right? Mm-hmm. It's a career. So um, I, I realized that it's not a popularity contest, right? Like mm-hmm. if I can, uh, I don't know, interview some some prolific name. Uh, like, what does that do for me, or what does it do for my listener or reader? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. What's what's the point? If most people it just try to engage in a pissing contest or so. Oh, look at me. Look at like, I don't. I never cared about that kind of stuff. And I think if we let that type of thinking go, then you can focus on your message and what you're trying to create and what you, what kind of value that you, you can uh, bring to the world. And if you spend most of your energy on that, then the rest will come, you know? Yeah. Uh, 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 one of the things that really meant a lot to me recently was that, um, so another guy that I uh, have studied and uh, also see as an inspiration is uh, Derek Sivers. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been in touch with him through email for a few years uh, when I actually got started. And uh, he's he's famous for just replying to everybody. And uh, that's one of the things when I saw initially, I was like, I'm going to do that as well. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, make that like a job of mine as well. Like, I try to reply as to almost everybody, mm-hmm. unless they're assholes, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, in that case, I won't. But um, uh, so uh, last week, one of my readers read my latest book mm-hmm. and emailed Derek uh, by himself yeah. and said, "Hey, you should. I think you should. I think you will like this book. Uh, go check it out." And I already sent my book to Derek <laughs> previously and then he emailed me and he forwarded the email and he was like, I think you really like this. And then <laughs> I, I read, <laughs> and I read the email and I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's what you want. You know, you want that mm-hmm. um, people will share your stuff because they want to and not because you push people or that you try to somehow, I don't know, fabricate some mm-hmm. kind of, I don't know, oh, look at me, I'm cool, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're hitting the nail on its head. It's it's about creating content that's worth sharing. And another term you like to use is you want to be usable. You want to be help, helpful, uh, useful and helpful as a human being. And how do you go about creating content that will resonate with people? And I know you write in your email marketing, uh, email marketing as in, in your emails about how to write better titles. And I use some of the tactics when I remember very clear, such as in your su- email subject line, when you include the word you, you know, when the person mm. opens up the newsletter, uh, it's more, the open rate will go higher. And I've yeah. tested that out and it works a thousand percent of the time. Mm. Um, 
you know, but how do you, do you ever find yourself kind of a uh, formulate, create titles all the time? Do you use like a, these additional tools, you know, like tube buddy or something to kind of create the perfect keywords and tag? How do you go about creating yeah, so, things that are worth sharing? So in the beginning, I uh, tr- uh, use those tools uh, like headline analyzers mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. And I, I, I teach that in my writing course as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I do mention that only uh, use those tools in the beginning when you're trying to figure things out and, and you want to have some guidelines. And, and it's like riding a bike. You don't ride a bike forever with those wheels attached, right? I don't know how you call those mm-hmm. things. things. Yeah, exactly. Support, with the additional two like wheels. <laughs> the support, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Like at some point, you want to be a grown up and mm-hmm. you just want to <laughs> just ride the bike by yourself. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing wrong with using tools. So that's basically my approach. Mm-hmm. Um, I started using the tools. tools. I started stealing headlines from other people, mm-hmm. uh, looking for inspiration. But uh, the last two years or so, I just... Um, I, at some point, you get a lot of readers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or listeners. And if you ask for their feedback or if you do surveys, which I, you know, do once or twice a year. Uh, and also if you welcome people replying to your emails, then at some point you'll get the input from mm-hmm. your audience. And I try to talk the way my readers talk um, mm-hmm. and use the same words that people reply me. Like one of, one of the, uh, the best examples is, I don't know, like two years ago or something uh, like that, somebody emailed me and said, hey, um, I'm really thinking about my next big move, <laughs> right? And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a great, because uh, you hear it often, but you don't, I didn't hear yeah. people really actually saying that to me. So I wrote an article uh, of something, I can't remember exactly the title, but Something like, um, read this if you don't know what your next big move is. Or yeah, I remember like that. that vaguely. Something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I actually got that inspiration from just listening mm-hmm. uh, to my reader and also just being open and just being aware, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this is the thing I think a lot of creators miss. And I also sometimes catch myself missing this is... It's very easy to get distracted by views or Mm -hmm. by Mm -hmm. income or by, you name it. I don't know. What what are some of the things that you, for for example, just as an example, look at on a day-to-day basis? True. I mean, I I will tell you, just like you, I mean, I stopped looking at them just like Seth Godin. I stopped looking at downloads and the likes uh, and the, the, but I do pay attention to comments and shares and actual Mm. feedback as opposed to you know, robotic clicks. But yeah. it can be uh, quite uh, luring. It's so, it's so, mm-hmm. At times, Very. I find myself just looking at stuff uh, that's not really important. Right. And uh, at those times, your awareness goes down. Mm-hmm. Right? So when you notice that for yourself, that your know, awareness goes down, it's very dangerous because you might miss Mm-hmm. the stuff that people are giving you. And I think this is, a lot of people say, hey, I don't know what to do, or I don't like, people are not listening to me, or like I, I create, I write articles and nobody cares, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that can be the case, but also, are you really paying attention? Mm-hmm. Right? Are you paying attention to what's going on? Mm-hmm. Are you reading the comments? Are you, Reading any replies, well, maybe you don't get any replies in the beginning, but are you reading other people's posts? Are you reading people's reviews of books? That's one of the things that I really enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I, I read on Goodreads and on Amazon, I just go through the reviews. I don't care about all the book, book blurbs. I don't read those, right? Because it's all advertising, right? Right, right. <laughs> I don't, I don't care about that stuff. I just go to, hey, what, what are people saying? And if they give two or three stars, why is this, right? Like, why, like, what are, what, are, what's the language that they use? What are the things they were disappointed mm-hmm. about, right? So that's how I try to listen 
and uh, and and remember, like, hey, what, what, like, what's your core business? What's 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 your core? What's what's the thing that um, you know makes you do what you do? Like, what's the number one thing that's important to you? Like in my case, that's writing articles. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, when I was creating v- videos, I noticed that myself as well. Like, hey, I'm I'm kind of being uh, a little bit. You know, I'm missing some stuff when it comes to writing. So I made the decision, like, I, I need to stop doing this, uh, like, this frequently with the video because my articles will decrease in quality if I keep doing this, right? Mm, interesting. So the, the, so that's how I think, you know, and I think the, the way of thinking is um, you can apply that to anything that you do, right? Like, Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in terms of you don't have to be a blogger, but you can use this this mentality mm-hmm. just to, you know, improve any type of creative work or just professional work, I think. That's great advice, especially for people who have already hit the ground running and maybe someone like myself creating content on a regular basis. Like, how do you focus mm-hmm. your energy? I know you talk a lot about yeah. methodologies, productivity, so I definitely encourage people to check that out. Um, you know... I, I also wonder, people always talk about finding your niche and, mm. you know, your niche clearly in personal finance, productivity. I don't even have to look at the, mm. the habits and decision making. And do you, I mean, how long did it take for you to find your, that niche? And some people argue that's not niche enough, of course. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and who do you think you're talking to? Like, how would you describe your audience? I know I packed yeah. two questions in there. Yeah, well, that, well, that's that's good because that's a, a an important topic, and a lot of people think about it. And I think mm-hmm. it's very complex because uh, it's difficult to get it right. But once you do get it right, then um, your 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 stuff will probably take off. But um, yeah. So I started with um, only career advice, mm-hmm. um, and the reason was so when I was still in London. I've been always interested in personal development and career development. So like, um, I, I, uh, I wrote an article about how I read two books a week. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been doing that for you know several years now. So at some point, people were asking me some stuff like, hey, how would you do this in terms of career decisions and career choices? And so that's how I got so I started thinking, oh, I, I can do some career coaching. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started, actually. I I did some career coaching with a few people that I got to know in, in the UK and in the Netherlands as well uh, afterwards. But then I started sharing the things that I talked about with them, mostly like sales and persuasion stuff. Like, okay, how do I get people to notice me? Or how do I get people to in, invite me to a um, a job interview, and one of the techniques that I learned over the years was use uh, the start your uh, email message of your, your subject line with a your, right? Mm-hmm. That's one of those techniques, and I started sharing that that kind of stuff, and then they got invited more often. They got a job, and then I was like, okay, oh, maybe I can turn this into like a website, and mm-hmm. um, started writing for that. But as I was uh, doing that, I was I kind of got bored with that relatively <laughs> quickly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Narrow, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and then I was thinking about like what you said. People say, "Hey, uh, choose a small niche," um, but at the same time, I was like, "Well, what are some of the topics that a lot of people are interested in?" Mm-hmm. Not only people are looking for a new job because that's always a very small group Mm -hmm. um, compared to people who are, for example, interested in the same topics that I was interested since I was 16, Mm -hmm. as in, how can I improve myself? Mm -hmm. How can I get more stuff done in the same amount of time or less less time, right? Mm -hmm. So that that was my mindset of like, I'm going to cover the things that I'm passionate about the things that are really important to me. And I learned through um, the career coaching as well. It's like, hey, these are challenges that 
a lot of people are facing. Like, okay, you get the job, that's great, but you also want, if you're ambitious, you're mm-hmm. thinking about, hey, what's my next move already? I think this is a, what a lot of ambitious people have is that once they get a job or when they start a business, they already start thinking about, hey, how, where can I take this, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, that's how I started thinking from small the big. <laughs> Actually, the other way around, like what most people recommend. So in my case, I'm a good example of the advice that you hear out there yeah. is not always true. Yeah. Uh, at least it's not true for you sometimes. Right. You know? Right. Hi there, this is Fei Wu and you are listening to the Face World Podcast. Today on Face World, I'm joined by Darius Furu, who is an author of six books, including Think Straight and What It Takes to Be Free. There's one question at the core of his work. How can we live a useful life that matters? Yeah, no, absolutely. I- Just like you said, that when people niche themselves in so deep and so early without exploring their own interest yet, I find so many people quitting because they got, they got bored. You know, just because you're a a salesperson for 25 years, automatically you're thinking, I should have a sales podcast. And Mm -hmm. this was actually a real scenario, but you know, you run out of fuel, especially if that's not even the career that you're interested in doing to begin Mm -hmm. with. So definitely open it up and, and before you find something that you really love. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, I'm just curious. I, I know we're running over a little bit. I knew this was going to happen, but we'll make sure to pick like the best pockets yeah. of information <laughs> to launch that. Yeah, well, I'm okay uh, on time, so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, you're uh, very interesting to talk to, which does not surprise me. Um, who are these people you're talking to? Like what what it approximately if you have surveyed them or or find mm-hmm. out something oh, about yeah, them yeah, oh, yeah. how old are they yeah. men women like what are they interested in where do they yeah. live in the world so um well funny enough uh, funny thing is that like 80 percent of my audience is the united states <laughs> and uh, <laughs> canada <laughs> um but I, I think the reason in terms of location i think is um uh, the u.s like U.S. obviously, I think, has the mindset uh, that I also have is that, you know, you, you want to grow, you want to improve. Um, I was thinking in terms of opportunity. So I think there's a very good uh, match from that point of view. Um, mm-hmm. You don't have that as much in Europe, for example. Mm-hmm. A lot of people here, like the majority here are like, oh, yeah, it's fine. It's good. It's good enough. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of um, in terms of age, I think there's that. It's funny, right? I recently got an email from someone who was 94. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I was like, how is that even possible? How, like, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, I, there are some people very yeah. Uh, the advance yeah. of digital technologies. It's <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's awesome because yeah. uh, like when I look at elderly people I know like they're not they are not up to speed at all yeah um but when I get these emails from people like hey somebody was 85 someone's 94 like the, I think the, the oldest was 94 so I was like well that, that's great I see that as an inspiration right like I, I want to be that way as well but yeah. um the group of people who read ranges from people in high school I get people from, in high school as well like very ambitious Mm -hmm. people, 50, 60 years old, email me saying, hey, I really want to make something out of my life. They're stressing. And all I say to them is just relax, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But um, yeah, from from like 15, 16 to 94, but there's a difference in the people who um, buy my courses. Yeah. And there's also a difference in people who um, uh, I think... uh, not, not the books, not, not so much. I think the books also um, is very wide, but the, the people who buy my courses are generally between 25 and like late 30s mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. want to, you know, make the next step in their career and looking for information, 
frameworks, theories, strategies, mm-hmm. and actual techniques they can use to get to the next level. Um, and 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 that's that's a group of people. And also, in terms of gender, uh, I think it was fifty two percent female and forty eight percent men. Mm-hmm. And and most of my students or most people who uh, register for my classes, the most feedback I get is uh, from the women, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. them, uh, in my experience, uh, in, in my case, more engaged, more um, thinking about the stuff and asking more questions. And, and, uh, and I really enjoy, you know, seeing that. And um, the men also obviously register for the courses, but what I see is often they, mm. you know, either, you know, don't have like, the, the need to <laughs> interact or whatever. I'm not surprised because <laughs> you, you know, like I know that I don't want to just compare two writers, but I didn't bring up Seth Godin and there are similarities where, I mean, if you attended one of Seth Godin's very like intimate gatherings at Hastings mm-hmm. and Hudson, you'll notice that there were more female than male. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. among the, the male students, they're not the, I mean, I do like Gary V's content. I you know agree with a lot of stuff he says, but they're mm. more, you don't see a lot of super macho like yeah. headline and, mm. you know, making all these like jazz hands type of men yeah. at his group. Yeah. Everybody's very grounded. So I am not surprised that your readers yeah. and your students are more, even a little more female and yeah. they love your approach. I mean, that's why we're yeah. talking, right? So yeah, yeah. 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 No, no I, I'm also... I'm not surprised as well. It's like I, it's like the that whole hustle uh, uh, scene is like not my scene. Yeah. Uh, so and I think um, yeah, I, I I really enjoy it as well because uh, I get actual you know good feedback stuff mm-hmm. that I can really use and um, and also just uh, not only for the courses but also for my content. Like I said mm-hmm. with you know the article that I wrote and. I th- try to, you know, do it as much as I can. Uh, uh, like, not every week. There's a reader question in my articles, but if you, like, go through my articles, I think, you know, every mm-hmm. one or two months or so, uh, I definitely pick mm-hmm. up a few questions, you know? Yeah, well, this is very yeah. helpful. And and to respect your time, I'm going to try to, I'm, like, trying to filter the remaining questions I have. Well, one of which... <laughs> Is uh, I want to acknowledge and really con- not just congratulate you, but acknowledge the fact that you're one of the most, not one of the most, I think you are the most read authors on Medium, which mm-hmm. is a, I mean, huge, huge writing blogging platform in the US and, you know, top 10, crazy, like top 10, top 20 websites worldwide. I, I was looking up uh, at least yeah. in its own category. And so like, I wonder how, you know, when did you see that see your blog, your content really take off. I mean, that is a, that mm-hmm. is a huge badge and an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're talking about it without saying it was a hustle and everybody should just follow this path and go viral. But yeah. like, how do you think that that actually happened for you? So I think a lot of things that we talked about in terms of listening and that kind of stuff, uh, that's, that's really, really important. Um, um, but also timing. Mm-hmm. And this is something that people don't really like to talk about. <laughs> right. But it's true, it's, yeah. You know, because you don't have control over that stuff. Um, so I started posting articles uh, 2015. Mm-hmm. And at the time, uh, it was just starting to get popular in terms of productivity and business and self-development. Before that, it was mostly like tech. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very famous in the tech world, obviously, because of the founder, Ev Williams, mm. who co-founded uh, Twitter. So it was really popular in that, in that kind of world. Um, but around that time, myself and a few other people started posting mm-hmm. articles there about personal development. Now, what a lot of established bloggers were thinking at the time was, why should I spend time on Medium, right? Mm-hmm. And this is, I think, uh, part arrogance, part um, just ignorance as well, uh, and also part 
being distracted, what we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. like not noticing things. Um, so, and I was like, you know, obviously I was just starting out. So I just went all in <laughs> and mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid of SEO things and stuff that people usually bring up like, oh, it will hurt my rankings, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? Let me just put articles on there. And there's a great community at the time already, people responding. And I was like, oh, this is great because I can connect with people, learn more about uh, their challenges and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I got started. And my my the lucky part of my story is that there were not a lot of people who were posting consistently on Medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just like Gary Vaynerchuk had had the luck of Twitter in the early days, when people signed up for Twitter, everybody got the suggestion, hey, follow these people, right? And there were only a few people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? So that is really important. Um, and for, I had the, the luck with Medium. When, when I started publishing two articles every single week, they were growing and the new people were automatically mm -hmm. uh, shown my content. Yeah, yeah. So that was really huge for me. And did you, by the way, did you split the content to publish, you know, different content on your website versus Medium to, you know, or did you post similar content and same content? No, I published uh, the same content, uh, in the, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now I do some special stuff, some exclusive stuff on Medium yeah. uh, because it's now they have the membership um, model where people pay five bucks a month. And I, you know, for that, I do some exclusive stuff, but, you know, for the first two, three years or so, two, two and a half years, yeah, I just basically cross-posted. Oh, uh, nice. And what I learned was that, and this is the thing that a lot of people didn't pick up, I think, was um, in this case, a lot of readers enjoy just using the app, the yeah. Medium app. Mm -hmm. And um, for them, it was already a um, like some some added value that your stuff is available mm -hmm. on the platform. And uh, to be honest, I'm not really afraid of like say, oh, well, you missed some traffic. Well, um, yeah. So uh, at least I can reach more people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is super helpful to hear that. Yeah. Um, I will try to wrap up with one last question, which is <laughs> <laughs> you are clearly doing a lot. You're very strategic about going at different things, but without overthinking all the processes mm -hmm. and or watching carefully what other people are doing. So I wonder your your day, your level of productivity, like how do you currently manage your days and your weeks? Do you, you know, separate them into today, blog content only, tomorrow, YouTube only, day after courses? Like what, what does that look like for you on a weekly basis? So the, the short answer is that I, I switch things up. Um, like you said, sometimes I dedicate a whole day, sometimes I, to, to writing, uh, sometimes I write every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, but my main philosophy is, and what I also teach in my productivity course, is that I want to do um, more work in the same amount of time, or at least I want to achieve mm -hmm. the same in mm -hmm. less time. Depends on how you look at it, right? Um, but what I like to do is I want to get the things that I want to get done that really um, move my business forward. Mm -hmm. in about three or four hours a day. And the reason that I mentioned three or four hours a day is because I noticed that throughout my working years that that's about the best that you can get. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, even when I worked from nine to five, like mm -hmm. I was just after four hours of focused work, that was it. You know, most of the time was spent on drinking coffee and just hanging out with coworkers, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Every, I think to know our own yeah. habits and yeah. follow the schedule <laughs> around it, it's really important. And faking to be some, you know, someone else or yeah. something else 
Yeah. Exactly. So that's my overall strategy. Mm-hmm. So my my goal is okay. I want to uh, grow my blog. I want to, for example, I want to create a new course, or I, if I'm working on a new book, say okay, I want to finish this book in two months or three months, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I think about how can I achieve those goals that I've set for myself mm-hmm. in about four hours a day. Yeah. And then I start planning my weeks. So that's one of the, the, the key strategies that I have been applying for like very long. Uh, as, as long as I can remember, I think I applied it in, in, in college. Um, just every Sunday, I sit down and just think about you know, what does this week look like? Mm-hmm. And for example, next week, um, I'm also still involved with, with my family business. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, uh, like a conference for the industry mm-hmm. or like a trade show type of thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, no, I just I, no, I think about your family <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, I still, you know, try to help out with that stuff. I, I'm not involved in the day to day anymore, but Mm-hmm. Um, on strategic stuff, I, I work, um, and you know, these few conferences a year, but, um, I look at the week and I'm like, okay, how am I going to plan this week? Mm-hmm. And then I come up with the stuff that you talked about. Hey, okay. Maybe this week it's better to dedicate one full day to writing mm-hmm. because I know based on my self-knowledge and based on the way this week is going to look like, I'm not going to write every single day, Mm -hmm. right? I I have to travel. I have to do this. I have to do that. I'm going to uh, use this strategy of I'm going to work on one specific project that full day. So my my productivity strategy is very fluid, very Mm -hmm. flexible. Mm -hmm. It's not very rigid, right? Like a lot of, productivity experts, uh, teachers, and whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, this is a system, and you have to do it like this, and you have to mm-hmm. grab this and put it in this folder or whatever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, yeah. <laughs> like, that's not how life works. In, at least, yeah, that's not how I live. So um, that's, that's about the, the most high-level answer that I can give. So like. Mm-hmm. It's a whole system, you know, and, and it's it's like a it's like a holistic thing. I think, yeah. Um, in in terms of energy as well, um, one of the my uh, part one of the strategies of, of my productivity system is to stay fit mm-hmm. and to work out mm-hmm. every single day. And you don't have to you know break a sweat every single day, but at least go for a brisk walk. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that 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 keeps me focused and. All those things that um, that you know influence your productivity. Yeah, the physical aspects of things. I can agree more. I think mm-hmm. you know, listen to your body, like the way you write about, and and I love how you write about personal finances. And and I will make sure to include all your social links and uh, and your website clearly to really address those things. So whenever people write about and and talk about and believe in index fund, I know I instantly like that person. <laughs> <laughs> I love how just simple your personal yeah. financial system looks like as it should be instead of mm. like tricking the market. Like, no, you cannot yeah. predict the market. You know, yeah, exactly. use your time doing something else way more productive. Yeah. And also it's like one of the things that I constantly repeat and it's one of the, it's like mm-hmm. investing is not to make money, right? It's like, it's not like the purpose is not to make money tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like the the purpose of investing to me is to build wealth. It's not to generate cash. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. yeah Long term. So, yeah. Exactly. And that's one of the topics that uh, I added over the the years of just uh, starting out productivity, doing and then habits, and then decision making. Mm-hmm. And the latest one that I added was uh, personal finance, based on just listening. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like after all the, that's why I also, it's funny that we recently changed the description for the podcast to, you know, how we help independent creators live, not just their creative freedom, but their financial freedom. And mm. to live it, I think it's so important because we've, we know people who make a lot of money, but don't really know 
how to actually live that freedom. And they're completely trapped inside that system. But, you know, someone like you, you know, I, I know you write about, you, you go to, you go to a restaurant, you have fun, you have these things you spend money on, and this is how you enjoy your life. And that's why I think your latest book, it's, it's really going to shine among your audience. Um, so I really appreciate the time that you've given This episode of the Face World podcast is brought to you by Face World LLC, our marketing service agency created for independent creators and businesses. We offer website development, video production, marketing mentorship to people who want to tell better stories, level up, and create a profitable brand. Face World podcast team are chief editor and producer Herman Ceballos, associate producer Adam Leffert, social media and content manager Rose de Leon, transcript editor Alina Ahmedova, and lastly, myself, the creator and host of Face World. Thank you so much for listening.